The next pre presentation uh, will be on the uh, evaluation of thin polymer overlays for bridge decks. Uh, I have with us here today uh, Dr. Habib Tabatabai. Uh, as he's an associate professor of structural engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. He is also director of the Center for Byproducts Utilization at uh, UWM. Uh, prior to joining uh, Wisconsin-Milwaukee, uh, in July 1999, he was a principal structural engineer with the CTL Group in Skokie, Illinois. Uh, Dr. Tabatabai is a licensed structural engineer and a registered professional engineer in Illinois. He has led several major research studies on design, durability, and repair of bridges and other structures. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm going to talk a little bit about summary of research, recent uh, research that we did on thin polymer overlays. And, uh, the research uh, included other aspects and what we're focusing on thin polymer overlays today. But towards the end, uh, we have a series of proposed guidelines by the research team regarding handling of ceiling and overlay applications for bridge decks. Um, so in terms of this research objectives, we were looking at the uh, assessing and comparing performance of selected P, uh, uh, TPOs and also looking at waterproofing abilities and to suggest appropriate bridge deck maintenance strategies. Now, of course, most of you are familiar with thin polymer overlay. This is some pictures from a test uh, application on the Marquette Interchange, uh, very close to here in Milwaukee. Uh, on the top left, uh, you see, uh, first there is a um, um, uh, shot blasting operation, cleaning operation, and there is a polymer applied and, and spread with squeegee, and then there is a hard, very hard aggregate type that's broadcast. And in terms of the multi-lift system, a second layer is added uh, after that. And you see on the bottom right uh, picture of how it will look like. The main, main feature of this is improving friction quite a bit. But it is also used as corrosion protection, and we wanted to assess uh, that. So in terms of the task, we did a review. We did some uh, in, a state agency survey in the form of augmenting a previous survey by the ACHRP had done, conducting phone interviews with a, a variety of stakeholders. And uh, we went through a material selection in con conjunction with our project oversight uh, uh, members, and, uh, and we went through experimental design. We're going to focus on the laboratory experiment here. And then we'll, we did some analysis and reporting. Now, in terms of materials used uh, as the variation, there are th th um, 10 different categories of specimens, laboratory specimens, and these are presented in generic form here in terms of the polymer used and the type of aggregate used in the thin polymer overlay. Uh, we had, of course, S0, what we call S0, which has a control, and there was no overlay system over it. We had a system, a two-lift system, a low-mod epoxy with the flint rock used as aggregate. We had the same epoxy as another group with Wisconsin granite aggregate, a third group with calcine bauxite aggregate, and these three, the, the, the parameter of epoxy was the same, just the variant was the, was the aggregate. We had S4 and S5 that we modified on common practice and tried to experiment with uh, possible methods where the S4 had a, a low mod epoxy as the first layer to get good bond and the second metacrylate la layer. And the S5 had a low mod epoxy at the first layer, but a low mod epoxy with an additive, which an FGD gypsum additive, was added as a second layer. That was based on our previous research uh, that uh, the additive improved properties. S6 was epoxy urethane in two lifts with calcine bauxite. Then we had S7, which is poly polystyrene 
which is a premix system. This is different from the other systems that is uh, aggregate is premixed with the with the polymer and placed uh, as a as a concrete in a way. And then we had uh, S8, which was a polyester styrene, but is a multi-lift system. And the S9 was another low mod epoxy with taconite aggregate. So the specimens, uh, there were close to 90 specimens. These are about 15 inch by 15 inch by four inch thick. There are two layers of bars placed in there to help us with the accelerated corrosion process. Uh, the surface were tined according to the processes typically used on bridge decks. Then the application, again, we had um, manufacturers rep were invited and we followed their procedures to apply these. On the bottom left, you'll see a multi-lift system being uh, placed. On the right is the premix system. Premix systems are thicker, usually about three quarter inch, while the two lift system is on the order of three eighths of an inch. This is a test matrix I'm not gonna get into, but each variant had three different specimens, and we had group A, B, and C, actually, the typo in there. Group A had no initial chlorides when we applied the uh, uh, polymer to it. Group B had moderate level of chlorides induced through accelerated corrosion process, and group C had higher levels of chloride. We wanted to see if you have contaminated concrete, whether you should apply overlay. Is it going to still help you with the corrosion process or not? These are some of the specimens in place for initial chloride introdu uh, introduction. We had a series of exposure cycles. We had put them through accelerated corrosion cycle, which involved salt water and electrical potential, imposition of electrical potential. Then we had a freeze thaw process, and then we had a ultraviolet exposure, heat exposure, and rain exposure cycle. And then we went through wear test, abrasion, and we had the snow plow actually simulate the snow plow. And then uh, we went through an inspection and testing for friction, and then we repeated the process three times for that um, to complete all of those uh, specimens going through these cycles. So very briefly, I'm going to uh, mention uh, the chloride exposure uh, they, uh, the top surface were subjected to 6% sodium chloride, uh, four days wet, three days dry cycles, and then at the same time, electrical potential was placed between the two bars to accelerate the corrosion and push the chlorides in faster. We had built a custom machine here, uh, affectionately, called the tormentor because it uh, on the there's three three drawers on the bottom that does the freestyle cycling three dra drawers in the middle that does the heat uv and rain cycling and on the top left there is our wear test where tires keep going on the specimens and then on the right is the computer control system for it um, we had a total of 50 freestyle cycles put in, and uh, there was actually, towards the end, we had the problem malfunction, so we did the manual way, moving specimens in the last cycle into and out of a, a controlled uh, freeze room. This one, for the high temperature, we raised the surface temperature to 120 degrees, we also applied uh, UV light to the surface, and then we dropped water on it to cool it rapidly to 70 degrees, and then we repeated that cycle again. Wear test, we adapted a um, National Center for Asphalt Technology machine, and we uh, modified it. We added friction measurements to the machine, and we added a snowplow feature to that machine. 
And then we went through overall about close to 100,000 past tire passages, which NCAT uses as the end of the um, for pavement type thing. That's the limit that they apply it to. So on the top left, you see the NCAT machine. On the bottom left, you see our machine. And uh, on the right, you see our snow plow that would fit between tires. And toward, at the end of the last cycle, we ran this uh, 50 times over the surface. So this would create a path uh, for the passage of the um, the tires, and we measured friction along that path by creating a special device for measuring friction, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. We also measured surface deformation or rotting along the path. On the left, you see the track of where the tire went, and then we had a fixture to measure surface on the outside of the track and inside and come up with a statistical average change in depth. This is our friction measurement. Um, one tire would be removed after each cycle, and then this will run electronically by pushing a button. We lock that wheel, and that creates a torque on the machine, and we measure that, and we calibrate against a force and calculate the friction coefficient based on that. We did pull out and core test. Now I'm going to give you some results. We don't have time to get a lot into results. I'm going to show you this. In general, eight out of the nine system pretty much similar, except one. There were some variations in them, but uh, one uh, which was the uh, polyester multi-lift system, complete, completely delaminated. These are the pull-out tests at the end of, uh, for group A, group B, group C, the different chloride levels. You see the S8 on the value of zero. And actually, this was in our lab. There was a similar system with a different aggregate put on the test section of Marquette Interchange, and that also delaminated after about a couple of years. Even though initial value of bond for all of these systems were over 400 PSI. But you see uh, all of them typically end up between three to 400 PSI. So you can apply uh, these to achieve good bond under at least laboratory conditions. But even if you have initial good bond, at least in that system, cause the failure of the system. Uh, this is some pictures from the bottom. It actually came, came off, even including the uh, material that got into tining areas. Um, I'm not going to touch a lot on, on uh, I'm just going to describe. In terms of corrosion, if you apply TPOs on chloride contaminated concrete, that is not a cor corrosion protection measure you are not going to get much benefit out of it. So if it is chloride contaminated, you still may want to use TPOs for friction. If you have an issue with achieving friction or maintaining friction, those will do the job for the given life expectancy of TPO. But in terms of corrosion, if the chloride is contaminated, you are not doing a corrosion protection measure by applying TPO on chloride contaminated concrete. Um, we measured corrosion mass loss. We used surface chloride. We measured coefficient of friction. We gave, for each measure, we looked at the different TPO systems. We measured an average and a standard deviation. So let's say for friction. We measured an average friction and a standard deviation between the different TPOs. And then we give an index, each value minus the average divided by standard deviation. So we had an index for corrosion. We had an index for friction, for rotting, for pullout strength. 
And these, if you get a number one, that means you are one better than average by one standard deviation. So now if you add all these four criteria, rotting, pull-out, corrosion, and uh, what did I say? Pull, uh, pull out and uh, friction, and add them out. The best would have the highest positive number. The worst would have the worst uh, negative number. So if you look at this chart, if all of these parameters are of interest to you, which not all of them may not be, but if all four you consider important, this would be a cumulative um, result. So. The best performing was a basic low mod epoxy with flint aggregate. Now, again, we didn't have significant, this is a little bit shows significant difference. Of course, you see the worst one was the one that delaminated. But uh, on the right, far right is the control. So the worst system that were not performing as good as control overall. But this is misleading a little because we're looking at how many standard deviations. So if, if the numbers are very close together, a number one may mean a small amount. So uh, overall, the eight out of nine TPOs uh, were performing somewhat similar, except the one. But there were some differences in there. So, before I get to some of the conclusion and concluding the experimental and give some guidelines, um, let me give you a little bit based on our study of some of the economic issues. Um, looking at penetrating sealers versus thin polymer overlays. Thin polymer overlays substantially, both on material installation costs, are substantially more expensive. Um, there is also more potential for premature failure if the surface preparation is not good at, at, at TPOs. But in general, I did an informal survey from suppliers, uh, DOT, and so on. So for a penetrating sealer, usually it's roughly about 30 cents approximate per square foot, while for TPO is $4.60 per square foot. Now for pre-mix one, I believe will be much higher than that as well, and the concrete overlays will be even higher. In terms of life, effective life for TPOs, we estimate based on the materials we have, uh, based on our research and we have materials and discussions, we expect it to be seven to 15 years. We suggest for economic studies to use a 10-year life for a TPO if doesn't have premature failure. For sealers, there's a variety of research trying to see effectiveness where before you can, we have to reapply. That we think it's on the order of four to six years. Based on this knowledge, we'll give you some guidelines later. But let's look at some of our summary. In general, one system, as I mentioned, uh, completely delaminated. TPOs can maintain your surface friction very well. Actually, a tight surface will start out as having higher friction, but over time will drop below all the TPOs. Okay. So TPOs, if the issue is friction, TPOs will provide that for you. Um, if you have pre-contaminated chloride surface, it does not help you match with corrosion if you apply TPO. <clears throat> okay, so anything, if, if your object is preservation, do it early. Whether you do uh, penetrating sealers or TPOs, it has to be done early before chlorides get in there. So getting into guidelines, again, this based on this research and some of the previous research that we had done. We, considering the cost and the reapplication periods, we recommend that you apply penetrating sealers sh shortly after construction, okay? And repeat that as three to five year intervals. We give we vary that based on ADT. In Wisconsin, 
the mean ADT for bridges is about five to 6,000. So we give for a 5,000 um, ADT a four year, and then based on that one standard deviation is about 2,500. So we change that from 2,500 ADT, 5,000, and 7,500 based on the period of your uh, ADT. Um, you should apply, whether penetrating sealers or TPO, ideally at the late spring or summer so that the seasonal rains, at least in this area, wash out the winter chlorides from the surface. If you can't do the sealer right after construction, try to do it while the deck rating is still nine or first five years, okay, before chlorides, and we are, our estimates our estimates suggest that the, within that five years, chloride thresholds get high enough, chloride values get high enough, that that becomes, loses its effectiveness. Now, so overall, penetrating sealer, the research team believes is the approach to take. However, if you have situations with very high ADTs and uh, application, whether three to five years, involves large traffic disruptions, then you may want to consider ADT, a, a TPOs, and apply it early similarly. So that has to also be applied early if you want it to be a corrosion protection measure. Of course, with both systems, you have to seal the cracks first uh, and with a compatible crack sealer before you apply them. Okay, now we debated whether to put criteria based on chloride levels, based on deck ratings. We decided to go make it simple with deck rating. We have data on, at least for Wisconsin, when different deck ratings on average occur. So we say for bridge uh, deck rating of seven, with no previous protection measure, applications of penetrating sealer or tin polymer overlay may potentially not be beneficial and they're not recommend. Chlorides are way too high at that stage, okay. For bridge deck rating of six, a recommended approach to install a latex or microsilicon modified concrete overlay. And that's, with my discussions a few years ago on a different study with Minnesota, that's what apparently when it gets to that, they do that at least on some bridges. Somebody may correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. But I looked at the data reliability of bridge decks in all 50 states, and Minnesota stands out as the highest reliability by the way, bridges in the northern, northeastern United States surprisingly have far better reliability than bridges in western and southwestern United States. You would think with the severe environment that we have, it would be the other way around, but it's not. Anyway, for bridge deck rating of five, would of course, uh, we recommend that the bridge deck be replaced completely. Now, in terms of TPOs, you can still apply TPO if it's eight or seven deck rating. But realize, or even lower, realize that the life expectancy, that you are not applying this as a corrosion protection measure. You may still need a friction measure. You may need it for better riding quality. But you are not using it for corrosion protection. And you have to weigh that 10-year life that you get out of it, ideally, under best circumstances, against the remaining life of the deck itself. Of course, you have to apply TPOs on solid concrete surfaces. If they are patched, the patch, patch has to be old so it doesn't off-gas and fail your overlay system. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, what kind of um, surface preparation was done on those uh, samples? Was it just the smooth, polished concrete? No, we, we actually shot plastered them uh, in a plastic cabinet. 
And uh, then uh, the, the same process that's outside done, we applied. And then for each type, we followed manufacturer's procedures for that. Okay. What, uh, do you know what IS, ICR, ICSP level you got? Uh, these were all, I think, I, I may be mistaken, but I think it's six or seven. I'm not sure right now. I have to look that up. Okay, and what um, aggregate gradation did you use? The aggregate gradation, we have, for each of the suppliers, we, first of all, they had to meet the Wisconsin gradation, but we left it up to them based on what their practices are within that uh, gradation, whatever they recommend for these types of applications. And your results came with chip flint was, was better than calcine bauxite? The chip, uh, flint rock was, uh, that's, uh, that's a caveat here, yes. Slightly, very slightly. We were surprised. We looked at the, we had supplied the uh, calcine bauxite because for high friction surface applications, they, uh, they use calcine bauxite exclusively, uh, my understanding is. And it has a requirement of 87% aluminum oxide content. So the, the supplier provided test data 87%, and we went through the testing. But as considering this, we looked at why is it that we didn't get while in, in high surface uh, friction uh, surfaces, we, you presumably get slightly higher friction. Why do we get it here? We did a X-ray spectroscopy, which is a surface, and we did not find that to be 87% aluminum oxide. So that's one thing that w it needs to be looked at more carefully, whether the material supply information test is sufficient for field applications or not. I recommend that there may be a, a lot of variability in there. I recommend that tests be done on project specific basis as opposed to a blanket. Uh, Did, when you said the chip flint wasn't as good as the calcine bauxite, was there any kind of wear track testing on the on the chip flint or to simulate the, the fracturing that a plow would do to it? We did the, we did the uh, 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 profile differences, and I, I, I have the data and see which one was, uh, was better. I don't have offhand remember that. But all of that is in the report, and the report is online, available. I can send a link to uh, anybody interested.